Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Hopewell Chingono. I'm from Zimbabwe. I'm honored to be here among us uh, friends and colleagues. Being here is a remarkable feat, considering that I'm from Zimbabwe. You never know whether you'll be allowed to leave the country or be arrested at the airport for having done nothing. It has happened to me so many times, as you shall hear. I was born 51 years ago at Harare Hospital. That is Zimbabwe's biggest hospital. Today, it has only two maternity theaters, and only one of them is working. Both maternity theaters were built in 1977 by the colonial government. It only costs 37,000 US dollars to build a maternity theater. But the ruling ZANU-PF government has never built a single maternity theater at the biggest hospital in Zimbabwe for the past 42 years it has been in power. And we are still counting. The government has blamed everyone except itself when 2,500 Zimbabwean pregnant women die each year from childbirth. That's the equivalent of 16 jumbo jets carrying only pregnant Zimbabwean women crashing every year and killing everyone on board. Right now in Zimbabwe, the whole public health sector does not have a single radiotherapy cancer machine. If you get cancer in Zimbabwe today, it's a death sentence, you will die. It costs only two million US dollars to buy a cancer machine, and yet we don't have one. As a journalist, I ask questions like why such things were allowed to happen and are still allowed to happen in Zimbabwe. Why are we so poor, yet the country is so wealthy? We have got almost every mineral you can think of under the sun, from diamonds, to gold, platinum, but our people are living in abject poverty. They don't have clean drinking water in their homes, in cities, not even rural areas. I started journalism at the Zimbabwe Institute of Mass Communications, then moved to England to get a master's degree, and it was there where I was trained to become a foreign correspondent. Whilst I was away, the ruling ZANU-PF had become so unpopular that the party's president at the time, Robert Mugabe, and his goons embarked on a violent land reform campaign, killing white farmers and looting their properties in a desperate attempt to regain political support, which it had lost because of the looting of public funds, the plan of the country's natural resources, general incompetence, mismanagement of the economy, and nepotism. Anyone who was perceived to be against the violent land seizures was called a Western puppet. This is how the ZANU-PF ruling elites deflect genuine and legitimate criticism. The assumption is that black people, we are not capable of thinking for ourselves. We need a white man to tell us that we don't have water today. We need a white man to tell us that today you are sick, you don't have medication, is because of the government. We are made to feel like anything that we say as citizens and complain about is because of the white man who is giving you these bad ideas to fight against uh, uh, the, 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 the government. Land reform was a very important thing that we all admired and wanted to happen. But it was pointless to have a land reform that was violent. There was no need for violence. And our economy is broken down, and the government will tell you that it's because of Western sanctions, but the violence that was used during land reform and the looting of the properties of those farmers resulted in basic things like fences being taken down and cattle mixing with uh, uh, um, wild animals, getting foot and mouth. We were exporting beef to Europe. We were not able to do that anymore because of foot and mouth. And that's why I say that the violence was not necessary. We could simply go and legislate in parliament and not have violence. As the violent land seizures continued, so did the attacks on foreign journalists who were stationed in, in Harare and across the country. They were called agents of Western imperialism, and they started kicking them out one by one. So when the BBC correspondent was kicked out, I asked the then BBC editor responsible for Africa if I could do the job. 
we agreed and I moved back to Harare, only to realize just how much things had changed in the nine years I'd been away living in England. When I applied for accreditation as a BBC correspondent, my former lecturer, now in charge of accreditation, declined, but then called me privately to his office. He told me that it was an instruction from the top not to give me accreditation, and that my once best friend at college was now the regime's media gatekeeper. I could only become a BBC correspondent, according to my former lecturer, if I was prepared to work with my former classmate and uh, former best friend, who was now an enabler of the regime. So I went back to England, this time to start documentary film. Upon returning, I made an award-winning documentary film called Pain in My Heart, looking at HIV and AIDS in Zimbabwe. It was a political metaphor for what was happening inside my country. When the foreign news editor at uh, Britain's biggest uh, private news organization, ITV News, saw the film, he hired me to cover Zimbabwe. It was one of the most defining episodes of my career. This was 2008. And there was a major election slated for the 29th of March of that year. But the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission refused to accredit me to cover that election. Privately, insiders within the commission told me that I had been declared a national security risk. Those of us that live under autocratic rule understand what that means. If you are fighting, criticizing, or opposing uh, corrupt rule, you are deemed a national security risk because you are opposing what is bad. Like I said to you, we do not have a cancer machine in my country. If I say that, I'm becoming a national security risk because I'm saying things that are not supposed to be said. I covered the election anyway, and when ZANU-PF and Robert Mugabe lost the election, they refused to relinquish power or even release the election results. Instead, they attacked our citizens with ruthless violence, and I found myself at the center of it as the first journalist to break the post-violence story on international television. I also found myself looking over my shoulders as the state security and police officers started tailing me and other journalists to instill fear in us. Autocratic regimes survive on instilling fear in citizens. I would move houses every night, fearing abduction by state security agents. Other critics were abducted and disappeared for days, only to be released, having been tortured. One such critic was taken away from his home. His name is Itai Zamara, and we have never seen him again. He was a journalist. By the time things calmed down, the state had made hundreds of his supposedly opponents. And after a coup in 2017, um, the military killed six civilians in cold blood during post-election uh, protests. And since then, after President Mnangagwa took over, he has proven to be more brazenly corrupt than Mugabe ever was. His corruption has destroyed our economy, healthcare system, and other public services, like roads. Most of our roads are potholed. As I said earlier, most people don't have access to clean drinking water, which is a basic human right. To understand the terrible economic decay of my country, when I started my journalism career in 1991, Zimbabwe's economy was bigger than that of Kenya. 30 years later, in 2022, Kenya's economy is five times bigger than that of Zimbabwe. And one in two Zimbabweans are living in extreme poverty. In 2019, I set up an organization I named Save Our Hospitals. This gave me a wide open window of opportunity to see the healthcare system up close and very personal. I became an accidental investigative journalist, something that I had not set out to become. I learned that all Zimbabwe's six central hospitals only needed 50 million uh, US dollars to run efficiently without shortages. Yet doctors and nurses had no gloves, and up to now they still don't have the gloves. There was and still is no medication in our hospitals. I just tweeted yesterday that one of the big five hospitals 
could not even give a patient paracetamol as of yesterday or MMT. It's not available, yet this is one of the big five hospitals in my country. The amount of money being looted every month in smuggled gold alone could run all central hospitals for two years without any shortages. The ZANU-PF political elites loot 100 million US dollars every month. Our hospitals, the central hospitals, require only 50 million dollars. So what they are stealing in a month can run the central hospitals in two years. That is the absurdity of how corrupt the regime has become. When COVID hit in January 2020, I started using Twitter and Facebook to expose how the government had destroyed our public health care. Everyone was terrified. I was terrified of dying too. And it was so terrifying that to see a government behaving in the way they were behaving, uh, one had to do something about it. Um, when I started using Twitter and Facebook to expose how the government had destroyed our public health care system, which led to a local politics organizing an anti-corruption march, I'd be, I became public enemy number one. On the 20th of July, 2020, seven officers armed with AK-47s came to my home, broke the French door leading to my dining room and dragged me out of the house, walking barefoot on top of broken glass. I was denied bail twice, and I spent 45 days in prison. They looked for a convenient charge and said that I had incited public violence. Most dictatorships use that charge when you have done nothing. After I left prison in September, I learned that the president's niece was caught trying to smuggle six kilograms of gold at the international airport, trying to smuggle it to Dubai. But because she's part of the ruling elite, the National Prosecution Authority was planning to give her bail unopposed. I exposed this corrupt deal online, and a couple of days later, there was another knock again on my door. I was arrested again. Initially, they said I'd broken my bail conditions for the first charge uh, of my pending case, but in police custody, they changed the charge and said I'd obstructed justice, more like I'd obstructed corruption. She was indeed offered bail unopposed, as I had said in my tweet, but the courts intervened probably out of embarrassment that I had reported about it. I spent another 23 days in prison for this without trial, and the charge is still pending 17 months later because the state has failed to bring the case to trial. Their excuse every day is that we are waiting for Twitter to respond. What they didn't know is we had already conducted Twitter, and we exposed in the courts that if you conduct Twitter as a government, that, that, that um, message you sent to them is logged on their, on their website, but it's not there. But because the judicial officers themselves have become part of that capture, uh, they don't care about the evidence. They listen to instructions that are coming from politicians from the top. But I refuse to be silenced. In Zimbabwe, arrest is a tool of persecution used to silence journalists, critics, and the opposition. We must hold the corrupt to account for their actions. Perhaps with my little efforts, I will leave Zimbabwe a better place than what it was when I came into it. As a society, as Africans, we were brought up to believe that when we came into this world, we found it the way it was. When we leave, we must leave it a better place. Thank you very much.